Are you like me and have at some point in time wondered where Hitler lived? Robin Leach knew we liked to know the inner workings of the lives of celebrities, famous people, and politicians. Hitler is, of course, no different. It's natural to wonder where he ate his slices of Fuhrer cake at four in the morning before going to bed, only to rise and shine at two in the afternoon and continue messing up literally the whole world, conceiving the deaths of millions of people. Most people see images of the eagle's nest and assume that was at least one of his homes, but that's actually not the case. The eagle's nest, though, is situated directly above where his residence was, the Berghof, here. It was here that Hitler spent most of the war years when he wasn't in one of his many super bunkers near the front lines. It was here that the leaders of the Nazi party would gather to live as close to a normal life as they could, munching on tea and cake, while simultaneously discussing the extermination of entire groups of people and how best to withstand a multi-front war. The Eagle's Nest, or Kielstein House, is what most people imagine when they see videos of Hitler, Eva Braun, and their entourage smiling and enjoying the views here in the southern German Alps. But a vast majority of that video was taken by Eva Braun herself on the patio of the Berghof, the residence below the Eagle's Nest. Whereas the Eagle's Nest was built for social meetings of the Nazi party, as well as for visiting government officials, the Berghof was literally where Hitler lived, had his offices, and did all of his normal things that people do day to day. The only place that Hitler spent more time than Berghof was the Wolf's Lair, in what is now Northeast Poland. Used to monitor and direct his army on the Eastern Front, the Wolf's Lair was his primary headquarters after the fall of France, and he initiated his biggest gamble of the war, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. With over three million German soldiers heading east, it is understandable he would be as close as he safely could to directing his forces. When he wasn't at his wolf's lair, under meters of concrete, there was a pretty good chance he was here at the Berghof. In fact, he spent a lot of the 1920s here when he wasn't in Landsberg prison. His second volume of Mein Kampf was written right here in the hut that sat on this stone foundation, known as the Kampfhausel, the Struggle House. Having purchased a cabin here in 1933 with money made from the sale of Mein Kampf, it was greatly expanded and renamed the Mountain Court, or Berghof. The chalet was refurbished and personal touches turned it from a Hitler house to a Hitler home. Its location nestled among the border of Austria and with friendly Italy nearby but separated by the Alps made it nearly impenetrable to Allied bombing runs and about as far from the fight as possible, ensuring the safety of the Fuhrer and friends. The chalet here was not a run-of-the-mill country home, though. SS guard posts and patrols prevented any unexpected traffic or visitors on the only road that led here, the Fuhrer Road. Some remnants of the main guard shack still exist, specifically the foundation. The entire structure had a maze of bunkers dug beneath it in order to facilitate protecting the Fuhrer from bombs or attack, or siphoning him to safety through a network of tunnels. As you get closer to the site, you see Hotel Sum Turkin, which can be seen in the background of many of the home movies from Hitler's time here. This was the barracks for the SS security soldiers who patrolled the grounds here. Hitler's personal bodyguards lived in a barracks directly adjacent to the Berghof. Beyond the grounds of the house itself, defensive and security measures were in place, including smoke machines used to conceal the area entirely and anti-aircraft positions to defend against Allied bombing. Some remains of the small retaining wall of the driveway exist, but as you come into the site where the actual house was situated, it is visually dominated by the only thing that survived after the war, the massive retaining wall preventing the hillside here from breaking off and damaging the dwelling. In front of the retaining wall would be where the chalet would have stood, facing to the north, having a view of both Austria and Germany and where they meet near Salzburg. It is obviously mostly destroyed, but with a little bit of visual archeology, span we can see remnants that still remain today. First would be the stairs leading from the driveway to the main entrance. These stairs were used not just by Hitler and his cronies, but was also where visiting dignitaries would be met by the Fuhrer, including Neville Chamberlain, Benito Mussolini, and even the future King of England, Edward VIII, when he and his wife were the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Besides Mussolini, though, a vast majority of the foreign visits happened prior to the invasion of Poland in 1939. These stairs would lead you into the entrance hall and then the Great Hall of the Berghof. Once inside, you were greeted with a display of cactus plants, oddly enough. 
Moving on to the Great Hall, though, was the main showcase of the property, a massive 90-pane picture window that looked out over the mountains to the north. Standing here, the Great Hall would be behind you, and you would have unobstructed views of the snow-capped peaks in the distance. Warming your back during the winter was the heat emanating from the red marble fireplace. This is all that remains of the fireplace. Historic meetings took place here with heads of state and Nazi elite. A guest here could lounge on the sofa facing the fire, or in one of the comfy chairs near the picture window. A grand piano was nearby to entertain you and the Fuhrer while you discussed how great fascism was, or how best to hide a genocide from the world public. You could do this while gazing at Renaissance art like Venus in Amor or the tapestries hanging from the walls. Caged canaries were kept in many of the rooms used to entertain dignitaries. Above you, the wooden lattice, alpine ceiling, sat below the residential portion of the chalet, the second floor. It was there that Hitler had his bedroom and office. Eva Brown also had a bedroom and bathroom connected to his. In that space, now occupied by treetops, the man who wreaked havoc on Europe and the world would do his ablutions. It's probably a little odd for us to think of old Adolf having to brush his teeth, shave, relieve himself, but putting it into perspective that for all intents and purposes, he was also just a guy, brings the air of preeminence back down to earth. The ability to see behind the curtain into the simple lives of the notorious allows us to understand that despite the cult of personality that he held, and that many today do as well, these are just people who have to do normal human things just like us. Whatever you did today, those of the highest influence also had to do. In the nearby guest bedrooms, you would have found watercolor paintings adorning the walls, done by none other than Hitler himself. Often described as cold, unfeeling, and clumsy, a guest here would probably spend little time wondering why he wasn't able to make a career out of it. Rejected from the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and thus had to turn to dictatorship. The area seen most often in the films taken by Eva Brown and by the professional photographers invited to the Burghof showcase the patio terrace. It is here that sweeping views of the Alps were used as a backdrop of not just significant meetings with Nazi elite, but also as a way to showcase Hitler as a friendly, neighborly leader. The propaganda ministry led by Joseph Goebbels would highlight the Fuhrer playing with his dogs or with children of Nazi ministers and generals. The residents in Alpine setting, combined with the smiling Fuhrer, showed him as a man of culture and vigor. This being the only place guests were allowed to smoke, and smoking being pretty popular at the time, a lot of the interactions with guests happened here on the terrace. You may even get to enjoy a vegetarian lunch on the patio most of the vegetables coming from the greenhouses right on site. It was a lovely place to enjoy the pleasures of the Third Reich. But, and this is a spoiler alert if you don't know how the story ends, the good times wouldn't last forever. In fact, they pretty much ended in June of 1944. Hitler's Eastern Front against the Soviets wasn't going great, and Rome and all of Southern Italy had been taken from Mussolini. So it was probably a real bummer when 150,000 Allied soldiers chose to have a beach day on his Normandy coast. The writing was pretty much on the walls at that point. Hitler left Berghof on July 14, 1944, just over a month after D-Day, en route to the Wolfslayer and Eastern Front. He would never come back to his Alpine citadel. According to the civilians who worked here, Throughout the last year of the war, the residence was kept ready and waiting for the Fuhrer's return. In April 1945, confusion struck the area as orders from Hitler, now in Berlin via Martin Bormann, instructed the SS guarding Berghof to arrest Hermann Göring and his family for treason. He was imprisoned in the bowels of his own home here, in the bunker network built to keep the family safe during attacks. Rumors of a coup by Heinrich Himmler also spread through the staff. This would go on as the Allies crept closer, with bombings increasing in the Obersalzburg area until April 25th, 1945, when two bombs actually struck the Berghof itself. The bunker system, though, was unaffected, protecting everyone in the complex. Two of Hitler's aides collected all of his correspondence hidden in the bunkers, as well as secret files, letters, and architectural schematics, and burned them in a bonfire on the Berghof Terrace. This continued to the destruction of all of Hitler's uniforms and clothing, as well as his and Eva Braun's personal photographs. Hitler committed suicide in the Führer bunker 
on April 30th, 1945 and the SS garrison here set fire to the villa and then escaped with the 3rd Infantry Division breathing down their necks. Upon hearing of Hitler's death, the locals here in Ober Salzburg raided all of the buildings that supported the Berghof, stealing as much as they could, including food and furniture, knowing that even harder times were approaching. The house was still smoldering when the first Americans entered the premise, searching through the underground bunkers. What they found was an organized network of tunnels to protect the Nazi elite and the workers and the soldiers of the site. Double iron doors guarded tunnels that could bring someone from the Berghof to any number of the surrounding structures or out to escape paths and the routes that would shuffle the Fuhrer to safety in the event his Alpine readout was breached while he was in residence. The Americans and their French counterparts would eventually make their way to the entrance to the Eagle's Nest as well. Though the elevator was sabotaged, the climb up to the Eagle's Nest was worth it to the soldiers of the 3rd Infantry Division. At the top, they found commanding views of the mountainous retreat. While drinking Hitler's wine, they sat in front of the red Italian marble fireplace gifted by Mussolini to Hitler for his new entertainment chalet. Many would chip away chunks of the marble as souvenirs, some of which are still probably hiding in plain sight amongst their old possessions and memorabilia odd red rocks that are otherwise inconsequential to the eyes of one of their descendants. After Hitler left on July 14, 1944, within a week he would be attacked in his wolf slayer by his own men. Operation Valkyrie was put into action on July 20th, with a briefcase bomb exploding beneath the Fuhrer's table in hopes of killing him and his top leadership. Hitler would survive, and those who executed the botched plan would all be killed by firing squad shortly after. The plan to bomb, suicide bomb, and shoot Hitler at Berghof had all been proposed and in many ways attempted without his knowledge while he stayed here at the residence. Multiple schemes had been developed by the German resistance with his upper echelon of military commanders. Some men even volunteered to blow themselves up in order to take out the Fuhrer, as was the case of Major Axel von dem Busch, who was going to detonate a landmine in a backpack while modeling the new winter uniform for Hitler. Really, any attempt at his life would most likely be a suicide mission. It wasn't just his confidants either. The British were going to send two snipers to paratroop into Austria and set up a position with a view of the Berghof in an attempt to shoot Hitler during his afternoon walk. By the time the possibility came to enact the plan though, Hitler was gone and would never return and the idea was scrapped. The Berghof would go on to be demolished by the new German government, with the Kielstein House, the Eagle's Nest, being converted into a beer garden and a cafe for tourists of the area, as you can see. The history of the place is not so much destroyed as it is retrofitted. As I mentioned about the attempts on Hitler's life, nearby is Albert Speer's house, who was the Minister of Armament and War Production. During his Nuremberg trials, he attempted to portray himself as a so-called good Nazi. In fact, he even described a potential assassination attempt he was going to make on Hitler by releasing Tabin, a chemical agent, into the Fuhrer bunker air system. You can check out this video here, where I explore some of the old explosive factories as well as a chemical plant that made Tabin. 